All right, uh, Acts 2.14. You're right, Tommy. We're turning there, you know, it's funny. Um, I saw this uh, meme recently, and it said, you know you're getting older when, and it had all these things, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get that, and then later on in the meme it said, if you have a favorite spatula, and this literally <laughs> happened to me this morning, and I thought, spatula? Who cares about a spatula? And... Um, Funny enough, this morning I went to make eggs for my kids, and I couldn't find a particular spatula, and it is the same spatula I've been using for 10 years. And I look through everything in the house, and I'm opening all the drawers. Who took the spatula? And then I thought to myself, oh, I do have a favorite spatula. Anyways, I thought it was interesting and funny. So uh, this week uh, I read this article, unfortunately, and um, the title of it was, Can Religion Make You Happy? And the article, second, sorry. The article itself um, was talking about loneliness, right? And I guess more and more people are feeling lonely these days. And at first, I just pondered on the first paragraph for a bit, and I was talking about it. And they were talking about how churches believe they have the cure for loneliness. Um, the person writing the article was not so sure. But, you know, the church is doing that. I continued to start to read. It just came across, it came across, and I'm reading and reading and reading. I noticed a pattern. And the pattern was Christian God religion, Christian God religion, Christian God religion. That's all that was being talked about, Christian God religion, over and over and over. And I ended up doing a word count in that article. And it said Christian four times. And it said God eight times. And it said religion 68 times. As I continue to read, and yes, I was still reading the article, um, the, the, the author said, now I lay my cards on the table. I am a Christian, but. And at that point, I was kind of done. I scanned the rest of the article, and then I decided, let's do another word count. How many times was the word Jesus Christ said in the article? Zero. It wasn't said in the article. He used the word Christian, Mark. He used the word Christian, but he didn't say Jesus Christ, right? Philippians 2, 9 through 11, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that all, so that at the name of, listen, at the name of Jesus, every kneel will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under earth and in every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord forever, all the power and authority of the world is under the name of Jesus Christ. That is the name. And it bothered me because this is something that's happening a lot. You'll read articles, you read things all the time, and they're not really talking, they're just using generalized terms. And I'm going to point these terms out to you that he was using Christian. Now, unfortunately, I feel like that's pretty wide these days, right? Like, it's huge. Like, what is it? We have different points in churches. We have major doctrinal differences throughout the church these days. When's the tribulation, right? Um, you know, are we supposed to grave soak or not? That's, you know, just ridiculous, weird things. There's this doctrinal differences throughout the church, okay? God, which God? Mother God, right? Wednesday night, Linda and Heido came to me and they, somebody came to their door and this is not Mormonism and they're talking to them about Mother God. Well, who are you made in the image of? You're made in the image of Mother God. But the gospel was still there. They believed in Jesus. They believe he died for their sins and all that, right? And then there's religion and that could lead to a whole nother service, right? And we understand that. So why am I bringing it up? Look at we have buried the name of Jesus Christ. We do not use the name of Jesus Christ enough, right? If you notice, and I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I can have conversations with people. I'm a Christian. Oh, me too, you know, blah, 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 conversation. And then you make a comment like, I just want to stay close to Jesus Christ and serve him in my life. And all of a sudden, the conversation drops off the cliff. Well, are you even allowed to say that in this restaurant kind of thing? They like look around. We're entering a new era, though, and it's important that people are proclaiming Jesus Christ. 
They're proclaiming our gospel, but it's not the same. And it's a, it's, it's a very interesting place, right? And I'm telling you guys this because we are to be bold. And when we go through this chapter, what we're going to see is Peter was absolutely bold. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. Once again, Lord, I lift this time up to you. I pray, Lord, that you fill me with your spirit and that I only say what you want me to say, what you want your people to know. I, um, I love you, Lord, and I know these people do too, and we just want to serve you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. But Peter, taking a stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judah and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. So Peter, he took a stand, he raised up with the 11, and he's talking to the men of Judea, and all you live in Jerusalem, right? And then he says, heed my words. Pay attention to what I'm going to tell you. Now Peter Let's remember, deny Jesus three times just a little bit ago. And now he's standing up. How is he standing up? Through the power. He, this is not a performance he was doing. This was a declaration of faith and conviction. He wasn't just standing up to stand up and have a performance. He was standing up because he believed. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he was going to teach the message that would be the message that we're at the church age now. It's the same message. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was the first time. This transformation was a testament to the power of the Holy Spirit. Peter was doing nothing by himself, right? He was doing everything with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it reminds us, it reminds me anyways, that I cannot do God's work without God in me, without the Holy Spirit in me. I need the Holy Spirit in me to do the Lord's work. Peter raised his voice and declared. I love it. Not even just see to stand up. He's raising, he's getting into this thing. Look, there have been moments in my life anyways where I didn't want to raise my voice for the Lord to defend the gospel. But there have been other times where I have, right? And I regret the times that I knew I was supposed to and I didn't, every single time. And then it goes on to say, you know, these men are not drunk as you suppose, for it was only the third hour of the day, but it was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then it says, here's what the prophet Joel said, and it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. These men are not drunk. That accusation was swift. That was the first thing he said. 1 Thessalonians 5, 7, for those who sleep, do their sleeping at night, and for those who get drunk, get drunk at night. That scripture is this one scripture that underscores that they're probably not drunk so early in the morning. And I love that the immediate correction, the immediate correction of that is crucial in apologetics, right? You need to shut that down. You need to shut down the misconceptions and pave the way for truth. And that's what Peter did right away. Right from the very beginning, the first thing he said, they're not drunk. You know, interesting enough, Hannah in 1 Samuel 1.13 was also accused of being drunk. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, how long will you make yourself drunk? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah replied, No, my lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. She was pouring out her soul, and Eli thought she was drunk. She was there with her family. There was a festival. She wanted a child, right? And the grief and the intensity of the grief made her pour out 
Like it says in Psalm 62, 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart or soul before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. But this is what was spoken of the prophet Joel. Peter continues on. That's obviously referring to the prophecy found in Joel 28, Joel 2, 28 through 32, which foretells the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It introduced, and this also introduces three Old Testament passages Peter will quote during the sermon. He quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32, Psalms 16, 8 through 11, and Psalms 110, 1. And so again it says, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. In the last days. We're in the last days, but we've been in the last days since the day Jesus ascended, right? It's just been a long last days. I mean, I look around and I say, we're really in the last days, but we're in the last days, <laughs> right? And it says in 1 Peter 1.20, for, for, for he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. He appeared to us. We're in the last days. He ascended. They're preaching the gospel. Now, this signified a new era of the Holy Spirit, Right? What it signified was it's for all believers, not just a select few like it was in the Old Testament, right? The outpouring was for everybody. Everybody gets to receive the Spirit who believes. Now, the Spirit, as we talked about before, convicts non-believers, but we get to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It also indicates that the gift of prophecy is for everybody, It covered everything, right? Regardless of gender, male and female, two genders, right? Regardless of age, he covers that. Regardless of even my bond slave, both men and women. So that's social status, right? It it went above social status. It supersedes all of that. And I want to just take a few minutes to go through that Jesus broke a ton of social norms in those days, right? He was not like everybody else at all. First of all, he offered grace and salvation to everybody. Luke 2, 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. For today in the city of David, there, was, there has been born to you a savior who is Christ the Lord. All people. That was not the norm back then. All people. Jesus bridges the gap between men and women. During the time of Jesus, women were held in a lower place in society. Jesus broke these social norms throughout, right? And, you know, and I'm just going to say, right, whoever teaches that the Bible oppresses women has never read the whole Bible and has never read the Gospels and never understand what Jesus did and how women were instrumental in almost every single part. But, you know, one of them is in Luke 7, 11 through 17. Soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nyan, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said, do not weep. And he ended up touching the coffin. And what happens? Young man, I say, arise. And the dead man man sat up and he began to speak. And then Jesus gave him back to his mother. Is that not beautiful? Fear gripped them all. A great prophet has arisen among us. God has visited his people. Jesus talked with this woman. He didn't have to. And he talked to her and he said, do not weep. He raised her son, and then he handed handed him over to her. Now, I want you to know that this time in history, leaders, religious leaders, would cross the street not to be in contact or near a woman. Not Jesus Christ. Jesus elevated women up. He elevated them. How another way? He elevated them by calling them daughters of Abraham. 
Luke 13, 16. And this woman, a daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan had bound for 18 years, should she not have been relieved from the bond, this bond on the Sabbath day? He elevated her up, daughter of Abraham. He broke cultural barriers over and over and over. Those are a very few of them. They're probably not even the best ones. I'm sorry, but you just need to know he recognized women and men equally. Here's another one he did. He ate with tax collectors and sinners. That was a social norm. No, right? Remember he, him in his house and there were a great crowd of tax collectors. This is in Luke 5, 29 through 32. And the other people were reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus touched a leper. Could you imagine? People would run from lepers, throw things at lepers, do awful things to lepers. When Jesus came down from the mountain, a large crowd followed him, and a leper came to him and bowed before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Right there, there's his faith, right? If you're willing. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately, his leprosy was cleansed, and Jesus said to him, See that you tell no one, but go, show yourself to the priests, and present the offering that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. He reached out, and he touched a man with leprosy. Jesus broke social norms. And I think this is something we should look at today. We as believers should be strong enough to break social norms. It says, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Philip's daughters prophesied. He had four virgin daughters that were prophetesses, right? Remember that? And then if you go through the book of Acts, it's over and over. There are just people prophesying throughout the book of Acts. And it says, I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the first half of Joel's prophecy has been fulfilled. The pouring out of the Holy Spirit, men and women have been prophesying. And now we come to the portion that really has parallels with Revelation, right? These signs described by Joel echo in the book of Revelation, indicating their ultimate fulfillment of the end time events. So let's go through a few of these together. Let's go Revelation 6, 13. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The stars in the sky fell to earth. Now Revelation 8:7 Let's go there next. The first sounded, and there was like hail and fire mixed with blood, and they were thrown to the earth, and the third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. So we're now talking about hail, fire mixed with blood, right? Just a correlation there. And then one more, Revelation 8, 12. 
The fourth of the angels sounded, and a third of the sun, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars were struck, so that a third of them would be darkened, and the day would not shine for a third of it, and the night in the same way. Those are just specific events. They correlate with each other. Wonders in heaven, signs on earth, right? What does that signify? It really signifies God's mighty power. He is in control and has all power and authority. There's a choice. This is what Joel was proclaiming, right? Repent. Call on the name of the Lord. Perish. There's going to be fire. There's going to be blood. There's going to be all kinds of stuff. Repent. Call on the name of the Lord. Perish. That is what Joel was saying. Repent or perish. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's for everybody. Then back in the text, in 22, it says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as yourselves, just as yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. Peter's addressing the crowd, and he's emphasizing Jesus of Nazareth was endorsed by God through miracles and wonders and signs. These were miraculous events, and we are evident, and we the people know all the things he did. Nicodemus acknowledged that Jesus' signs indicated divine approval. John 3, 2. This man came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus knew he had it. It was a divine approval. Jesus himself explains it also. He explains that his works testify to his divine mission. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. This is John 5, 36, by the way. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me that the Father has sent me. Amen. The Father has sent me. Jesus was accredited, the Father sent him. Peter then highlights that the crucifixion was part of a plan. It was foreknowledge and it was foretold. But it's also interesting that he points out, even though it's part of it, human responsibility is also underscored in there. As Peter accuses the crowd of participating in his death. Isaiah 53.10 reads, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, put him to grief, if he would render himself as guilt, as a guilt offering, which can read as a sin offering. He will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Foreknowledge. Jesus indicates that his betrayal and death are decreed, yet betrayers are still responsible. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to the man by whom he is betrayed. That's Luke twenty two twenty two. The early believers did recognize Jesus' death as being predestined by God. For truly in the city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. It was predestined. I know I'm hammering on that. It was predestined. (laughs) Then it says, but God raised him up again. 
Amen. God raised him up, breaking the power of death. Christ's resurrection signified new life for all believers. Romans 6, 4, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in newness of life. Newness of life. We have newness of life, people. It continues on and says, we're in verse 25, for David said to him, we're moving on to David, I saw the Lord always in my presence, <clears throat> for he sat at my right hand so that I would not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter is now emphasizing that the resurrection of Jesus is his fulfillment of David's prophetic words. Peter quotes David, indicating confidence in the Lord's presence, right? And it also prevented him from being shaken. What did David say in Psalm 16, 8? I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. David constantly expressed his continuous focus, and reliance on God. What about gladness and rejoicing? Psalm 16, 9, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh will also dwell securely. Do we dwell securely in the Lord? Is it nice to dwell securely in the Lord? David's prophecy also highlights that God will not abandon him to the realm of death. God will not abandon Jesus. God will not abandon the Holy One. God will not abandon him to death to see decay, right? It says, for you are not abandoned my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow the Holy One to undergo decay. This was God's promise not to leave the faithful one in the grave, Jesus Christ out of the grave. David rejoices in the knowing of knowledge of the paths of life, right? He rejoiced in the knowledge of paths. He knew it, and he says it in, in Psalm 1611. You will, make me know, you will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. So we have God's presence. I saw the Lord always in my presence. We have rejoicing and security. I will not be shaken. We have the promise of the resurrection. Nor will I allow your Holy One to undergo decay. And we have the path of life. Make known to me the ways of life. He will guide, lead, and direct us. We have to ask him. We have to spend time with him. Back to verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And also because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay like we just talked about. This Jesus, God, this Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Remember, all the witnesses are there. Therefore, having been exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For was it not David who ascended into heaven, but he, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Whew. Therefore, I let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. So Peter's letting everybody know David 
through death and burial, spoke. He's dead, but he spoke prophetically about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is what Peter's telling everybody. David foresaw that the Messiah would not be abandoned. He would not see decay, and he would be resurrected. God's promise to David about his descendants going in and leading to Jesus and the kingdom will last forever. That's what he's talking about when he says God sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne. And 2 Samuel 7, 12, it reads, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come from you and I will establish his kingdom. It, he shall be built on the house. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Peter asserts again, God raised Jesus from the dead, and the apostles were the witnesses. And that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Caiaphas and to the twelve after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, and last of all, and last of all, as one ultimately born, he appeared to me also. That's in Corinthians, right? He appeared to everybody. He appeared to the 500. He appeared to the disciples. He was raised up. It was verifiable. We talked about that stuff in chapter one, but it was verifiable. There was a bunch of witnesses. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. And then we get to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Jesus speaks about the coming of the Holy Spirit after his glorification, John 7, 39. But he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were received, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus has been glorified. Jesus is up at the right hand and the Spirit comes pouring out on his people. Peter is underscoring the divine authority and fulfillment in Jesus. David as a prophet foresaw the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is exalted at the right hand. And then quoting Psalms 1.10.1, Peter confirms that Jesus is the Messiah who is exalted and will have his enemies subdued as a footstool. Back to verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting, exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles. And all those who had believed were together... <coughs> And all things in common, they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as any would might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor, for with all, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the people were deeply moved. What do we do? 
What do we do? What do we do? Peter instructs, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That is awesome. Times of refreshing. I'm not going to say one of those words I normally say. Times of refreshing. Repent. Turn to Jesus. The promise of the Holy Spirit is for all, including future generations, all the way off. Creating the praise of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far and to him who is near, says the Lord and I will heal him. Far and near, the Lord wants everyone. <laughs> that doesn't mean everyone wants the Lord, as we know. So Peter continues on to tell the people, repent, repent for a perverse generation. So you'll prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. We need to do that. We need to be the light in the world. And I'm not going to pass the perverse generation part and not talk about the Last Supper at the Olympics with the trans people. If you're watching the Olympics and there's a Last Supper going on and there's trans people... I would recommend turning off the TV, opening the Bible, and lifting up the Lord. We're not helping the cause by taking in this perverse stuff going on. We're not doing it. And your box at your TV has an ID that gets sent back up, and, and Patrick knows what I'm talking about, and all that data is analyzed on who's watching what. Do you want to stand before the Lord? Well, Lord, but I really like Sally did the twirly thing and I really wanted to see the twirlies. It's perverse. They're indoctrinating a generation and they're making it normal and it is not. Those who accepted Jesus were baptized, 3,000 believers that day. You know, Hebrews 10, 25 do not forsake your own assembly together as it is a habit of some, but encouraging to another. We don't, we're not supposed to forsake our assembly. We're supposed to be getting together. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to have fellowship. We're supposed to help each other. Now, I do want to say the early church did practice communal living. Socialism, I'll just say it, right? They were there. They were sharing everything, and let me tell you something. It doesn't last long. It only lasts a few more chapters. Why is that? Because men is sinful. We always want more, unfortunately. But that's why we need Jesus Christ. We're not perfect. We're sinful. And we're going to learn that later on. They praised God and joined the favor of the people, and the Lord added to their numbers. In Acts, it says, you know, 5.14 it says, And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly adding to their numbers. I think about that, and I think about Diana and Roderick and what they're going through, and they're out there going door to door, trying to, to get people to know the Lord, to get people to even listen to the smallest thing, maybe the smallest flame in there, right? But... <laughs> We got work ahead of us, folks. That's for sure. And it's not our works that are going to do it, but it's us getting on our knees and reading the Bible and lifting up the Lord and then going out and being the light. We cannot do it, but we sure can be used by God to help spread it. So in closing, I just want to say, I stated at the beginning of this message, right, that there's power in the name of Jesus Christ, and there absolutely is. Jesus Christ can absolutely heal loneliness. 
It doesn't take a pill. It doesn't take anything. It takes Jesus. But, but, there is a caveat. You better be prepared to battle your flesh. If you're not prepared to battle your flesh, I don't know why you think anything else is going to happen. Jesse, you know, shows me this video I love, and it's, it's God standing there, and there's a guy, and he's like, I got this, and I got that problem, and it's God with a chisel. Maybe a lot of you have seen it. And God's knocking things off. And, and the gentleman's willing to have the things knocked off. They're willing to change. They're willing to surrender their lives to the Lord. You better be prepared to just take gigantic chunks of your flesh off. But I promise if you go and you're lonely and you take and don't look at yourself and start looking at other people, amazingly enough, you're not going to be lonely anymore. You're not. You can't have both. If I'm out helping some, if I'm helping Heido, I'm not going to be lonely I'm now helping someone. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, we have this problem with the internet and everything else where everybody is so isolated that they don't even understand. You, you, they don't even know how to like conversate with people, let alone anything else. They're lonely. Yeah, they don't have the Lord. They don't understand. Go help other people. Peter was filled with the power of the gospel message for the people. I pray this week, that, as always, I will pray every week that we have the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody new. Before I close, I just, I just want to answer this for everybody because multiple people have come up to me and asked me the, the, the same question and I just want to get clarity so everybody knows. I did not go to Bible school. Okay? I just love the Lord, okay? None of these people here went to Bible school, okay? And if you listen to anybody's story ever, like Greg Laurie is a great example, the next day he's at the beach converting people. School does not mean you know how to teach. School does not mean you know how to preach. School does not mean you know how to love people. School is just school. It's book knowledge, so I'm just getting it out there now so I don't need that question asked anymore and it's nothing I love you guys and you can ask me again if you want and it's not going to bother me. But I didn't go to college. Technically, I didn't go to any college. Okay, but I do run a company. So I'm doing okay. And that's by the grace of the Lord. Right? It's not by me. I did nothing. Right? I lifted up. I gave my life to the Lord and I just want to serve the Lord. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are an awesome God. I pray, Lord, that you will fill these people, overfill them with the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray that we each will take this week and just open your word, Lord, and let it talk to us. Let us guide us and lead us on what we're to do, Lord. This is so temporary, and sometimes I know we like to feel like it's permanent. Please bless this congregation, Lord. And I don't mean that. It doesn't have to be financially. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's marriage. Maybe it's anything else going on. Maybe you need a place to stay. Lord, I lift these people up, Lord, your people, and pray that you just hear their cries, hear their prayers, and if it's in your will, Lord, that you answer that. I pray, Lord, that you do put somebody in our lives, Lord, this week. that we can just talk about you too. They won't be offended by the name Jesus Christ, but that, that'll pierce their heart like it did, Lord. When Peter was talking, pierced their heart. We give the glory to you, Lord, in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen.